You're listening to Inner Guidance Channel. We are told that as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, What will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? This is a long chapter. You read it in the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. I think most of us are familiar with it. It's in the 24th chapter of Matthew and the 13th chapter of Mark. But here are the highlights. He said, Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines. There will be earthquakes in various lands. They will come saying, Here is the Christ, or there he is. I tell you, believe them not. This is not the end. These are the sufferings, the tribulations, the sorrows that must precede the coming of the Son of Man. The word translated for us in the King James Version as sorrows and then tribulations and sufferings in the Revised Standard Version means literally childbirth pains, the pangs of the birth of the Messiah. All these things must happen. In spite of all the organizations in the world trying to organize peace on earth, there are wars forever and forever. The conflicts in man produce conflicts in society. Go home. Is there harmony in the house? Well, that added to another house, added to another house. Multiply the conflicts in the individual's life and you find the wars all over the world. There are wars and rumors of wars and there is never peace here on earth. Don't look for it. You'll never organize it. These are the birth pains of the coming of the Son of Man. But now he gives them a sign. What is the sign? That's what they ask for. He said, as the lightning comes out of the east and shines as far as the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. There will be no doubts in the minds of the man or the men in whom he has come. Just as a flash of lightning lights up the entire horizon from one side to the other and exposes the entire landscape in one flash, in an instant. So this comes just like that. You don't expect it. It comes suddenly and lights up the entire landscape and then you know who the Son of Man is. That's how he comes. Now the words translated as he sat on the Mount of Olives. Well, the Mount of Olives we find in the Old Testament. We find it in Numbers. We find it all over the Old Testament. But there is a prophecy in Zechariah in the L fourth chapter that before the coming of the Lord, the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west and a large valley, a deep valley will divide it. And then one half will move northward and the other half will move southward. See Zechariah 14.4. This must happen before the coming of the Son of Man. Now, there is no such thing as any Mount of Olives, no matter where you look in the world. Oh, they will call a mount in the Near East, the Mount of Olives. It is some other place, it note, meaning within. The whole drama takes place right here in us individually. You are unique and everyone contains the entire Bible right here. As he said, he who rejects me has a judge. My word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. John 12, 48. I tell you, the book is contained in you and you are here for one purpose, to fulfill scripture. You are not here for any other purpose. You may be led to believe you are here to make a fortune, to become famous, to become great, to become some intellectual giant. You are here for one purpose, to fulfill scripture. For when you fulfill scripture, the wisdom of God is yours. The power of God is yours. Everything that is God is yours. For it is God fulfilling his word. You are his word. The word is called Christ. Now listen to these words carefully. As we come back eventually to the splitting of the great Mount of Olives. It must come first. It comes before the appearance of the Son of Man. It's such a shock to the man in whom it happens. It just comes suddenly, just like the flash of lightning. That is the being. I am he. 
but it comes that way. But now let us show you for a moment who the Christ really is in Scripture. Christ is defined in Scripture as the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of man is in his seed. That's his image. Therefore, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his image. The image of a man is in his seed. Now we turn to the third chapter, the L6 verse of Galatians. And the promises were made unto Abraham and his seed. It does not say seeds, referring to many, but to his seed, referring to one, which is Christ. I am quoting scripture. I am not elaborating. I am actually quoting the L6 verse of the third chapter of Galatians. The promise of God to his friend called Abraham, the father of the multitudes. His offspring would exceed the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Genesis 22, 17. But it's not to the physical descendants. It is to a seed, his only son. Not to the physical descendants, but to one to which he will give his promise. And he gave the promise of himself to that one. And it said, which is Christ? That is the actual quote in the third chapter, the L6 verse of Galatians. Now we are told, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So Christ, that same Christ, for there's only one, is in you, the seed of God, which is the image of God, which eventually will reflect the glory of God. It is the power and the wisdom of God. It is in man. It has to be brought forth. It must reach the point where it can expand and burst. It actually bursts. To grow, one must outgrow, and it grows. And finally it bursts. And then the most amazing thing comes out. You don't realize until it happens that you are the one spoken of in scripture as Jesus Christ. You are the son of man. Now, what is the splitting of the great mountain? It must first split right down from east to west and leave a large valley and part, one moving northward, one moving southward. When you read that, you wonder, well, when is this mountain that they call the Mount of Olives going to split? It is splitting all the time because the whole thing is here. It happens just as told you in scripture. As the lightning comes out of the east and shines as far as the west, so will it be with the coming of the Son of Man. Just like that, but may I tell you, one moment after the resurrection, for the whole thing is based upon the resurrection. The solution and the only solution of death is resurrection. There is no other solution. Man first is raised from the dead. He doesn't know he's dead. He hasn't the slightest concept that he is dead. He struggles to keep what he calls alive. He ensures himself burdens himself with all insurances just to keep alive. He takes all the things in the world just to keep going. He calls this being alive, but he doesn't know he's dead. He is actually dead and it is for a purpose. God actually died when he dropped himself in me. He dropped himself in me as his seed and his seed is Christ Jesus. And he has to die to be made alive. A seed must fall into the earth. Man is called the red earth. Adam means red earth. So he falls into the earth and dies in order to be made alive. Unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. John 12, 24. And so it comes in and drops into the mind of man. It's the word of God. The story is all about you individually not collectively. Now, on this day when the mountain is split, may I tell you from my own personal experience, I never read it in a book. It is foreshadowed in scripture, but it is not explained. All the things that I have told you in the last chapter of my last book, I have experienced. I have not read them in books. They are all in the Bible, but they are only foreshadowed. They are adumbrated. In other words, they are so presented symbolically and in a figurative manner.
that it leaves much to man's mind about what is happening. In other words, it is not a conclusive thing. It doesn't etch it. It simply foreshadows the event. And when it happens, you wonder, well, this is what it meant. You stand startled. But one night, after you are resurrected, you will find yourself suddenly, you go to bed, and it's a normal night, the day was normal, and suddenly you are split by a bolt of lightning from east to west, from the top of your skull to the base of your spine, and the body parts just like this, indicating the two sides actually move this way, come apart, and at the base of your spine is the golden liquid light that is alive. And as you look at it, without anyone prompting you, you know, it is I. You are actually looking at yourself, and yet it's golden liquid light. It's the blood of God, the living blood of God, and you are that blood. And you fuse with it, and then like a serpent, you move up the severed body and tie it together once more, right into your skull. That's how the Son of Man comes. He started that way, and he ends as a fiery serpent, the wisest of all God's creatures. It was I that fell. It is I that moves up, this time with light in himself, not a living body, but a life-giving spirit. And you move up and reverberate the entire heaven, which is your skull. The whole thing is unfolding right within man. So when they speak of the signs of the end, don't look outside of yourself for any sign. There will be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, every conceivable horror in the world, but that is not it. When it comes, it comes suddenly, just like the flash of lightning, and man experiences all the things that are said of Jesus Christ. Make no claim that you are Christ for the simple reason no one in eternity will ever believe it any more than they believed it when it was first said. It is said, his brothers did not believe in him. His own people rejected him. And so he said, He who rejects me has a judge, and the words I have spoken will be his judge on the last day, because he is going to experience the same thing that I have told him. When it is explained to him by revelation who he is, he will know I did not lie because we are all members of a body that share in the one grand experience, all of us. We are all the one Christ. There are not a billion of little Christs running around. The same seed, only one seed. Listen to it carefully. The promise was made unto Abraham and to his seed. It does not say seeds, referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, which is Christ. And so in everyone is buried Christ. I am the tomb. You are the tomb in which Christ is buried. And Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's a deliberate plan, not some afterthought. He said, He made clear to me the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, both in heaven and on earth. So, here is a plan. Well, the plan is contained in that seed which is contained in man. It's a plan. At a certain fullness of time, the seed, like all seeds, bursts, and the first bursting of it is the resurrection. The seed bursts. It's his skull. That is where it is buried. And then the man finds he himself has been buried there. He doesn't realize it until then. He didn't even think of it. When I was told the story by my mother, she was the first one to tell me the story of Christ. Then in Sunday school, they repeated what mother told me, only they elaborated it. I went to school, and they did the same thing there. Then I read the Bible myself when I could read the same story. It never occurred to me that it referred in any way, even in the most remote way, to me. I thought it was all related to a being who lived 2,000 years ago. I hadn't the slightest idea that the whole drama was all about me. As I now know, it's all about you. About every child born of woman. Everyone is that story, but it's not told that way. It is told in a way that we have made an idol of something, and we have forgotten the meat of the story. 
the instrument that conveys the instruction. We are worshipping the instrument rather than the instruction. The first gross sense we have accepted is the fact for what the ultimate sense intended. So, it's a story. It is an epic. That is what Christianity is and it's based upon resurrection. If there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. So it begins with that. And you are told, at the last trumpet he awakens the dead. Well, the word trumpet means reverberation. That's true. You go to sleep and suddenly there is a reverberation in your head. You have never felt anything like it before. It's unlike anything you've ever known before. Oh, I have held things, magnets, in my hand and my whole body goes this way. I have touched something inadvertently and all of a sudden I am shocked. But that's not what I am talking about. This is something entirely different. It's a vibration centered in your skull and suddenly you begin to vibrate and you can't stop it. You don't know how it started, but you can't stop it. Then as you can stop it, you begin to awake and you wake in a way you've never been awake before and you find yourself sealed in your own skull and out of your skull you come just as a child out of the womb of a woman and you are born from above you are not yet clothed but no one can see you with the mortal eye you are invisible to the mortal eye they can't see you but you can see everything they are thinking about their thoughts are as objective to you as you are to me now. Every thought, whether they express it in words or just simply think it, it's all heard by you. You hear it. And everything round about you is so vividly clear, and you've never had such clarity before. And there you are, born from above. Then comes the great revelation, which I would consider it the greatest when you discover yourself as the Father, when God's only begotten Son calls you Father, and you look right into His eyes, and then, and only then, do you really know who you are. Yet the Son of Man hasn't come. He doesn't come until the next experience, and when the next one comes, then you move up like lightning into your skull. Following that comes now, the sign given in Scripture, and the one on whom you see the dove descend. That is He. And so I was told by the Most High God, the one on whom I saw the Holy Spirit descend, that is He, anoint Him. And so I saw the Holy Spirit descend in bodily form as a dove, and it rested upon me, and there it remained. As you are told, it must remain. It mustn't fly away. It remains. And the vision breaks while the dove is still upon you, smothering you with kisses. That is when the seal is placed upon you and the drama is over. You only linger in the world for a few short years to tell it to the few who will hear it. What does it matter how few hear it? You will never have a billion to hear it. How many heard it when it first happened? We didn't have TV then or radio or books printed. It was all handwritten in script. How few heard it at first and yet it has spread all over the world. So, it doesn't matter if tonight this small number hears me. This is a larger number than those who heard it the first time. And someone will tell it in the same wonderful form, but they don't have to change our wonderful script. It is there for eternity in the Bible. But you could tell it in detail, how it really happened, and not simply foreshadows it, for the scripture only foreshadows it and prefigures but it doesn't give the detail as to actually how it happens. Now you have heard how it happens. And so no larger number than this heard it, and it will go on forever. For the word cannot return unto God void, but it must accomplish that which he purposes, and accomplish that for which it was sent. It must. It cannot be void, for the word is in man as the seed of God, which is Jesus Christ. So. The signs of the end have nothing to do with anything on the outside. If tomorrow you read a headline that Russia has moved on Europe, that's not the end. That's part of the sufferings of the birth of Christ. If tomorrow you hear of some setback in Vietnam, 
That hasn't a thing to do with any end. These things go on and on. You may tomorrow hear of the most violent quake and get horrible stories of friends of yours who made their exit as a result. That is not the end. They don't die. They are restored to life instantly, but they have not been resurrected. Man must be clothed after his resurrection in his immortal body. That is his body. It's already waiting for him. It's not something that you manufacture out of this, indicating the physical body. It's not the result of a natural development out of the physical body. It's already part of the plan of God, and so you have your garment. I have my garment, and I will know you by your garment. Now, there will be false prophets in the world who will appropriate that garment, not appropriate it, but will tell you. So, you are warned in Scripture to test every spirit, whether it be of God, for you are told in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians that Satan will claim he is the angel of light. You are told in the 8th chapter of John that he is a liar and the father of lies, and he will come through sensitive souls and distort them, try to disillusion them, try to get them to falter along the way by claiming he is that which has been revealed otherwise of another. You will see it in Scripture, and so don't for one moment think it's not all within us. The devil is not another. It is all within us, the doubter. He causes man to doubt. He is the liar in man. He cannot believe the truth when he hears it. And if the ear is open as it should be in all of us, he comes through. But you are told, test him. Ask him a simple question. Now you've told me that you are this light and not the one of whom you heard. Well now, tell me a simple thing. What will I do tomorrow? Ask him. He knows so much. Ask him the simple little question. Tell me now. He that you've just denied that it's his garment, what will he be doing, say, next Friday? Not standing on the platform, for that I know, and therefore you will know it too. But what will he be doing, say, on Thursday? Give him that. Test the spirit, whether he be from God. If they can't answer how, well then, they are liars and the father of lies, as told us in the 8th chapter of John. So, in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he is declared the liar, for he claims that he is the angel of light, and he is not light, he is darkness. He is all death. He is all doubting, he is the liar. So, test everyone who comes inwardly, either in your dream, your vision, or when you are really beginning to awaken and the voice is being heard by you from within. But I tell you, all these things happen to you. They will. You have a garment prepared, eternal in the heavens. You are first resurrected, invisible to those who see the sign of your birth, but they cannot see you. Then comes your discovery of the fatherhood of God, and you are he, for his son calls you father. That's a sign. Then comes the great splitting of your body, this Mount of Olives, from top to bottom, and the great valley is formed, and the division one moves to the northward, one moves to the southward, and you move up as the very blood of God himself, for life now is in the blood, we are told in Scripture. Drink not the blood, for life is in the blood. Then he tells you, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part of me. So, you actually absorb it like a blot of ink, some little blob of ink on a blotter. It is absorbed. You look at it, and you are absorbed by it, and you are it, and you move up like the spiral being of light. Then comes, after this, the descent of the dove, and then your nakedness is now clothed. For we are told in Scripture, unless we are clothed from on high, we are naked, Man remains spiritually naked until he is clothed with his risen body. And so these are garments of skin. You are told it all the way back in Genesis. He made for man garments of skin to clothe and to hide their nakedness. The garment itself, not this, 
indicating the physical body, but the garment itself is the skin that he made me, for I am spirit. Now we are told in the same book of Genesis, the 37th chapter, And Israel made for the one he loved most, the one called Joseph, a gown of many colors. The same argument comes all the way through. It is the father who makes it. God made it for the first coats of skin. Now Israel, which means by definition, one who rules as God, not like a God, but as God, all the difference in the world. He is God. So here is Israel, and he makes for his son, the one he loves most. He makes him a coat of many colors. We come all the way down to the wedding garment, and finally we find here this garment that God has already made for every one of us awaiting our resurrection. It's the garment that we will wear in the resurrection. And I will know you by the garment that you wear, as you know me now by this garment that I wear, indicating the physical body. If I take off this garment of flesh, you wouldn't know me. You know me here by reason of the fact you know this garment of flesh that God made me, this skin. You will know me tomorrow by my heavenly garment without any uncertainty. There is no uncertainty when it comes from the wisdom from above, none whatsoever. The disciples knew the risen Lord by his garment that he wore. He could not have worn flesh and blood, so they would not have seen it. They knew him from his risen garment, the eternal garment. So, they'll know everyone. I'll know you, just as my friend spotted me and knew me without any uncertainty. That is Neville. She didn't see the form, and she never encountered a man called Paul, but she knew him with the same certainty that she knew me. So, let no one cast doubt upon such knowledge. These garments we know each other by, and they all form the one garment, the one body. As we are told in Ephesians, there is but one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, just one all the way through to one God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. And so we are all sharers in this one body, and all will experience it, and eventually all will be clothed in their eternal garments. And just as you know me by reason of the fact that I wear this physical garment, you will know me by reason of the fact that I wear my eternal garment. You'll know me just as you know me now, in fact, more intimately. For then you will know that we are one, though we have not lost our individuality. We have not lost any such thing as the being that I know myself to be. So, these are the signs of the end. The sign may come this night to you, I do not know. As you are told, when? He said, no one knows the hour or the day, only the Father. So let no one tell you that he can from your horoscope or teacup leaves or your aura or anything else, tell you anything about the great mysteries of being. He can't. That's all nonsense. And so, tonight it may be that he will come to you. And when he comes, you can't stop it. You'll begin to vibrate. And may I tell you, if it happens to you as it did to me, you will think, this is it. Meaning tomorrow, they will find the body dead because you can't see how you can survive it. The vibration is so great, you do not believe you can survive it. But far from just surviving it, you awaken. And you didn't realize until then that you had been asleep. And because you awaken in a tomb, well then, you not only were asleep, but the sleep was so profound you must have been dead, for they thought you dead. So the seed was alive when it was planted in the ground, but it had to die to be made alive. So we are told, Unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, then it bears much fruit. It cannot remain dead. It's alive first, it falls, and it dies. So Christ literally, the seed of God, it's called sperma in scripture. It's the sperm. Literally translated, it means the seed, the actual seed from the creative power of God, buried in man, and then it comes out as man. 
So God becomes as I am, that I may be as he is, paraphrased from Blake's Jerusalem. And forever, I am simply expanding and expanding forever in the bosom of God. Who is expanding? My own wonderful human imagination. That is the being that is expanding, expanding forever in the bosom of God, clothed in my heavenly garment. So here, after it happens to an individual, he is sent into the world to tell it. And he tells it to the best of his ability. Some reject him, some will not believe him. But I say, he who rejects me has a judge, and the judge is the word that I have spoken to him. That will be his judge on the last day. He may be a year away from it. He may be a thousand years away from it. But because these words are spoken, he will remember it, how he rejected it when he first heard it, if he heard it and rejected it. So do not look for any other ism. There is no other ism. It is all right here in our wonderful Bible. The Old Testament is the plot. The new is its fulfillment, but it's not clarified. It is not given to us in detail. It's simply foreshadowed. But having experienced scripture, I am sharing with you what I have experienced. I have experienced the entire story as told in our New Testament concerning the character called Jesus Christ. And I am just as weak as you are, just as fragile as you are, as fragile as the character personified there was. For not a thing is said in that story concerning his strong physical being or his beauty. No description is given of the man. He simply is denied by all who knew him. He is interpreting scripture within himself and no one believed when they heard it. That's the way it ought to be. They had their own preconceived notions as to what scripture should mean. And when it didn't fit their preconceived misconceptions, they rejected him. He should come from without, like some great leader on a white horse, and lead us to victory over our so-called enemies. And we have no enemies outside of ourself. There's not a thing outside of man. So, all the conflicts raging in my world simply mirror the conflicts raging in me. That's all there is. So, he expects someone to come from without, but he doesn't come from without. He suddenly awakens. He erupts from within. And here I am. And you stand amazed. May I tell you, when it happens to you, you will be the most strained, amazed, awestruck person who walks the earth. You can't believe it. How could something so glorious happen to me? A sinner, not only one who has sinned, but is still capable of sinning with all the weaknesses of the flesh. You haven't overcome them. And with all of these things, it came to you. Then you realize the mercy of God, that our fitness for the kingdom of heaven is the consequence, not the condition of his choice. So he chose me in him before the foundation of the world, before he brought forth the universe, for he brings forth the universe as a theater wherein he manifests the power of his purpose and the wisdom of his purpose. He brings it forth, but before he brought forth the universe, he chose me in him. Therefore, my fitness for the kingdom is not the consequence of anything that I did, not the result of anything I did. It's simply his gift. He gave it to me before the world, but he had to send me through the trials. But when he sent me through the trials, because he sent Christ in me as himself, who suffered but Christ in me? For Christ in me is I am. That's the Christ in me, for that's the God in me. So, Everyone is moving forward through the frightful tribulation of the world, and suddenly, when he least expects it. The night it happened to me on the 20th day of July of 1959, eight years ago, in the city of San Francisco, I hadn't the slightest idea that this was in store for me that night. I went to sleep normally. I called my wife and daughter in Beverly Hills and had a little chat. I read a few passages of the Bible, I read a bit of Blake, and retired. In the wee hours of the morning, here comes this uncontrollable vibration in my skull, 
waking me from my eternal sleep. But it presented me in my skull sealed. Therefore I knew it was a tomb, and only the dead are in tombs. So I knew whoever put me there thought me dead. But in this case, he planted himself there. But he planted himself in such a way that he had to completely forget himself. That's death. A complete amnesia is death. He had to completely empty himself of his glory to become us, which he did. And so I walked this earth believing I was awake, believing I was alive, not knowing that the being who is dreaming the whole thing was sound asleep within me. And that night, he woke in me as myself. And I came out to find the same symbolism as told in scripture surrounding the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, and three men to witness the event, two to deny it because how could Neville ever have a baby, and the third agreeing to it and just presenting the evidence. And then, taking that infant in my own arms and becoming ecstatic in my love for this Christ child, and as I am holding the child, it smiles, this heavenly smile, and the whole thing dissolves. So that's the first sign, which is the resurrection and birth. Then come the others, and all the others are signs of the end. So the end does not mean this world is coming to an end. This is a cradle to bring to birth God in man. So this whole vast world is only, I would say, educative darkness. It's a cradle. And when man is brought to birth here, it means that his world here is at an end. It's the close of this age to him, but it goes on to all the others who have not yet been brought to birth. So, we continue forever in this world until we are brought to birth, because death does not end it. When one dies, don't think for one second that he has ceased to be. This world does not come to an end where our senses cease to register it. We know that much. Therefore, why should something come to an end? Because we can't touch it. They are clothed instantly in the same dream body. This bodily form that bleeds if you cut it, that hurts if it is wounded, and it struggles, and it struggles here, and it marries there as it marries here, and goes through a life just like this until it is awakened. And after the awakening, then it's the close of this age and the entrance into another age, which is called in scripture, the kingdom of heaven. And don't try to picture it from anything you know here, any more than that which was never a butterfly, could ever conceive itself a butterfly if it only knew itself to be a caterpillar. It could never in eternity conceive of that transformation. So the transformed. You cannot be judged by anything you know here. Only the few who have been gifted and blessed to ascend the mountain of transfiguration to behold the beauty of that form, know what that form is like. And to know the being who is wearing the form without seeing face, hands, or any part that it knew here. Because you are known by the form there as you are known by the form here. But it's an entirely different being. And all will be gathered into one body. And in the end, there is only one body. And that body is the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We are all sharers in the one body. Now let us go into the silence. 